Today I'm answering this Cambridge IGCSE biology paper, paper six, the alternative to the practical from June 2021. A student investigated the effect of the concentration of sugar solutions on osmosis in potato cells. The student labelled four test tubes A, B, C and D. The volumes of one mole per dm cubed sugar solution in distilled water are shown in table 1.1. We used to make solutions containing different concentrations of sugar in each test tube. Complete table 1.1 by writing in the concentration of the sugar solution in test tube C. So in order to work out what goes here, you need to work out the to total volume of fluid, which is 20, and then how much of that is sugar. So effectively the calculation is 8 over 20, which is 0 0.4. The student was given four potato cylinders, which had all been cut from one potato. The diameters of the potato cylinders were all the same, but the length of the potato cylinders varied. The student cut all four potato cylinders to exactly 40 millimetres in length. One potato cylinder was put into each of the labelled test tubes. The potato cylinders were left in the sugar solutions for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, the potato cylinders were removed from the test tubes. Figure 1.1 is a diagram showing the actual size of the potato cylinders from test tubes A, B, C and D at the end of step 6. So just to make a few notes, we know that our independent variables, so what we're changing is the concentration of solution and we've been given quite a few control variables here, such as the time they've been left for, which was 20 minutes. The fact that you have the same potato. The fact that they were the same length, which was 40 mil. Prepare a table to record the results in the space provided. Measure the length of each of the potato cylinders figure four, in figure 1.1 and record these measurements in your table. So first of all, in our table, we need the concentration of sugar solution. Make sure you steal the units for moles per dm cubed. And then we need, as our second column heading, the length in mil, in millimeters. after 20 minutes. So make sure you have those units. So we go 1, 0 0.6, 0 0.4 and 0. And then make sure you measure them. So measure the length of these using your ruler in millimetres. I'm going to struggle to do that on the iPad. The answer here is 35, 37, 39 and 42. If you've measured those accurately, and I'm just going to seal my table up. Explain why it was important that the potato cylinders were all cut to the same length in step four. Well, you only want one independent variable, which was in this case, the concentration of sugar solution. Obviously, if you have more than one independent variable, it's going to mess up your results. Identify the variable that the student changed in this investigation, the independent variable. Luckily, I've said this many times, it's the concentration of sugar solution. What have you changed? Suggest two improvements that you can make to the method used in this investigation. Well, if you've done this at school, you tend to want to be measuring the change in mass rather than change in length. You could have also used lots more concentrations of sugar solution. You could have repeated. You could have ensured that we had the same temperature throughout. We could have ensured that we dried the potato cylinders before measuring the length. I'm choosing repeat at each concentration of sugar solution. As well as, as well as measuring, measure the mass, 
rather than length. Describe one safety precaution that should be taken while preparing the potato cylinders in step four. Okay, it's this fact that in step four we're cutting, so we need to be careful with that scalpel. So you could write anything from cutting up the potato chips on a tile or a wooden board or just making sure that you keep the blade away from your body parts. Plan an investigation to find out the effect of temperature on osmosis in plant tissue. Six marks. If you've been watching me for a while, you'll know that I like laying out in terms of independent, dependent and many control variables. So the independent variable... What are we changing? Well, in this case, we've been told to change the temperature. So I will use a range of temperatures. E.g. 0 degrees, 10 degrees, 20, 30, etc. How will I maintain those temperatures? Using a water bath or several water baths to be fair. What am I measuring? So the dependent variable, I'm going to measure the change in mass. And give a time frame here. After 24 hours. What about my control variables? What am I keeping the same? This time I'm keeping the concentration of sugar solution the same. Variety of potato. Immersion time, which I've already specified as being 24 hours. Starting mass, that's, that's very important. few extra details such as drying the potato chips before I measure the mass because obviously we'll have some extra solution attached if we're not careful. And by doing this you should really make sure you're picking up those six marks. And as always repeat at each temperature and calculate an average. Potato cells contain starch grains. State the solution that would be used to test for the presence of starch and give the result of a positive test. Use iodine solution. And it turns blue-black in the presence of starch. Figure 1.2 is a photomicrograph of some plant cells that contain starch grains. Draw a large diagram of cell X in figure 1.2 and label one starch grain on your drawing. And Martin's going to draw this because he's a lot better at drawing than I am. Line AB represents the diameter of the starch grain. Measure the length of line AB on figure 1.2 and you want that answer here in millimetres. So you're measuring this distance here in millimetres. And if you've measured it accurately, you should get a value of 10 millimetres. Calculate the actual diameter of the starch grain using your measurement for line AB and the formula. So, notice that we're giving our answer to two significant figures. So we've been told in the question that the magnification is times 800. So 800 equals the length of that line, which we said was 10 millimetres. Then we're after the actual diameter, which is x. So x is 10 divided by 800 to get 0 0.0125 as the answer, and so to two significant figures, that's 0 0.13. And that's in millimetres, that unit. A student monitored their pulse rate after exercise. The student's pulse rate before exercise was 62 beats per minute. The results are shown in the table. Plot a line graph on the grid, include a line of best fit. So first of all, let's work out our y and x axis. So the thing that you're changing the independent variable goes on the x-axis, 
what you're measuring, the dependent variable, goes on the y-axis. So let's start by drawing our scales. There's y, there's x. Time after exercise, don't forget your units. In minutes, pulse rate beats per minute. Now pick some sensible scales. We need to go up to five here. That fits on really nicely. And then we're going from 62 to 156. So let's go up in 50s on the y-axis. So the first reading is 0 and 156. Second reading is 1 and 108. Then we have 2 and 78. Then we have 3 and 66. 4 and 62 and 5 and 62. So now we need a curve of best fit, which I always struggle with. Okay, that will have to do. But you're trying to get as many of those points as close to the line as possible. Describe the relationship shown in your graph between pulse rate and time after exercise. So you can see that as the time after exercise increases, the pulse rate decreases, and it's a non-linear relationship. Look, we've got a curve. And we can see that that pulse rate plateaus as that time increases. Calculate the percentage change in pulse rate from 0 minutes to 5 minutes using the data in table 2.1. Give your answer to two decimal places and here's the space for working. So percentage change, remember, is change over original times by 100. So here's the data. We need to do our change, which is 156 minus 62 over the original, which is 156, and then multiply that by 100 to get 60.02564, which to two decimal places is 60.26. State the variable that was measured, dependent variable in this investigation, well, it was the pulse rate. The student monitored their pulse rate after exercise on three separate days and calculated the average pulse rate from the data they collected. Explain why the student correctly calculated the average pulse rate at four minutes after exercise as 63 beats per minute rather than 82, so there must have been an anomalous. Okay, so we're looking at this row here. Here is the anomalous data. Look, it doesn't fit the trend at all. So 120 beats per minute is the anomalous result and therefore needs discounting. Figure 2.1 shows a cross-section of an artery and a vein as seen using a light microscope. State one visible similarity and two visible differences between the artery and vein shown. So they have to be things that you can see. So we can see here that the vein has a much larger or wider lumen than the artery. we look at the muscle and elastic fibre walls, we can see that the arteries wall is much thicker than that of the vein. What about a similarity? Really basic things. They both have a wall, they both have a lumen, or they both contain blood cells. So don't overcomplicate things here.